Hey everyone, on this episode of Inside the Mind, a podcast about athletes, I have Edgar Chikera, who is a mental performance coach in the UK. He works with a lot of unique athletes that are involved with CrossFit, uh, esports, and even some rugby players. So we talked a lot about that in this episode, but I won't spoil too much of it, so roll the intro. So I focus on optimized performance using sports psychology principles. So it could be also looking at attention, uh, motivation, confidence, aggression, anxiety, and all of that, like mental good stuff, really. So I've, so undergrad, I did in sport and exercise psychology and masters as well in applied sports psychology. So from there, like during my undergrad as well, I was in, in, in like a placement um, mm-hmm. applying and working alongside the psychologist that we had there and then I'm um, in my master's as well kind of doing applied work here and there and then now I've kind of gone on my own so I've more recently done it uh, within esports as well which is quite niche and normally people are like oh this is new um, but I've also done it like in traditional sports too so mainly within boxing um, boxing football rugby and more recently athletics where there's um some like international runners that are will run for like GB so mainly for the indoors as well so indoor 60 meters and then outdoor 100 meters as well so a range of places or range of clients really and that's because I just love applying the psychology and actually helping any athlete that's there too so I think Mm -hmm. I tried to go into disabled sports as well but then no one really got back from there so it's not like I specify one thing I just like seeing what the demands are in different sports and seeing how psychology kind of fits into that as well. Yeah. What was kind of your, uh, your your motivation to getting into the field? Kind of for me myself, being an athlete growing up, there were so many instances I look back on where kind of all the training that I have to date, I I wish I had it back then. Yeah. And I think that a lot of things would have been, a lot of things or specific moments I can think back on, I probably would have handled it differently. And I think that was kind of my main motivation. That and of course, just my love for sports and just being around sports and loving helping athletes in general, those kind of two things were my motivation to get into the field. What were your some of your motivating factors? Yeah, I think that's probably there's um, always like a matchup with a lot of people who do sport and then like any educational form because they wish that they knew that all, like, all this information when they're an athlete. I think going back as well to my time as an athlete because I mainly did rugby. So within that time, I'd have like coaches like say, yeah, um, you know, be more confident or, you know, stop being so nervous and stuff, right? And then as an athlete, I always got frustrated by it because I'm like, yeah, it's good telling me that, but how do I do it? You know, right. you can't just, oh yeah, you know, just stop this way and start doing that more. But, you know, no one gives you these like strategies or no one tells you like, let's say the importance of your thoughts, feelings and behaviors relating to each other or like what habits you're starting to develop and like conditioning and all that kind of stuff. So I wanted to, first of all, I think I was curious anyway. And another one is the fact that when I was trying to find university courses, I really did like biology and I liked um, psychology as well. And also I like sports. So when I was like at a university fair, I was like, what do you think kind of matches this all together? And someone suggested sports psychology. So I thought, ah, I might as well try it out, you know, and I did. And yeah, I've liked the whole aspect of applying everything and how it all kind of relates to each other. And I know that, you know, it's not talked about as much. So I also do like podcasts like these as well. So more people actually understand that the mental side can be addressed. And that different people have different journeys and what they're applying. But then, you know, you can actually take control of your mental side, not just, you know, general commentators being like, yeah, you know, he looked really focused or, you know, they're always confident and the team always needs to be together. You actually give them something that's practical as well. So I kind of like love that kind of bit of it. And that's kind of what drew me into it. Yeah, I think one of the things that you touched on that I would consider probably one of the basic like foundations of our work and just sports psychology in general is, is how you're mentioning how your coaches would be like, don't be nervous, don't do this, don't do that and everything. But I think it's so important to not like, of course we want to be optimal performance at all time, but it's I think really important to accept and to kind of consider that at some points you are, can be nervous. You can be things like it's, I think it's important to accept them and use them just as learning opportunities. I think the more you kind of shove those things to the side, it doesn't help create learning opportunities to try and overcome it the next time that situation might come up. Exactly. And like the fact you bring that up as well is the fact that, um, let's say some athletes don't even like know how to reflect. So I know being able to actually regulate yourself is really important and also knowing how to understand the learning opportunities that's within the experiences that you have. So like let's say a coach would be like oh why aren't you learning but then they don't tell you how to reflect you know 
us going back to what's going on, seeing what's good and why, what's bad and why, like maybe the interrelation between your thoughts, feelings and behaviours and how that contributed as well to what you're experiencing. And then, you know, it's knowing that and knowing how you can actually manage yourself as well is like so important to, and, mm-hmm. you know, these, it's not told as much by coaches, but I think coaches now obviously are opening up more to sports psychology and like the support there. But then you sometimes get coaches that don't open to it as well, which I've experienced before. Yeah, um, yeah. 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 I think I think one thing one thing that, you know, whatever we talk about today, whatever we're kind of doing our practice, it, it not only applies just to like it, obviously we work with athletes and we work with them specifically in in whatever game they play, but the strategies that we try to give these athletes or we try to preach about, they can be used in all, you know, aspects of life, whether it be like family or or relationships or just you know, at school, maybe potentially, but the strategy, like the, the basic foundation of these strategies, we might be applying it to sport, but they really help just overall of the life of, of an athlete or a person. Like it always transfers any, like mm-hmm. even there's like a little bit that you might not think works. Like let's say with goal setting, if you do that within like an athlete and then they realize, oh yeah, I can apply that to my eating habits or, you know, in terms of like relationships as well, or just general life goals too. And yeah, you're right that there's such a big transferability that's there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But, um, yeah. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, if you had anything to say. I was going to say, like, what have your experiences been like when you've been applying it into sport or in, like, bridging the behavioral or the behaviorism side of it into sport? Like, what have your experiences of doing that been? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, like kind of the, the one thing that really stands out to me is that, um, you know, a, a lot of times when you have youth athletes, there's – a bit of a conflict, I would say, between the youth and their parents about, you know, um, their perfor- their performance in, you know, primarily here in Canada, the main sport is hockey. So I'll use hockey as an example. Like, there's always the cliche of like the 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 car ride to the hockey game can be just silent, right? Where there's not a lot of dialogue, or like the car ride home from the hockey rink is silent because you know something bad may have happened, and maybe they don't have the right tools to approach the conflict or or the negative situation, how to address it, and and kind of how to learn from it. Um, so, for example, if a kid had a bad game, you know, there might be no dialogue whatsoever for that whole car ride home. And it just kind of creates a bit of a strain, I feel like, in, in, in the family that, you know, what happened at the hockey rink kind of lingers on at home and, and all that stuff. So, um, you know, that's one example where I can think of where you, you give an athlete or a family, in this case, kind of the tools to deal with some something that came up during a game. And it just kind of makes the whole overall family situation um, just more pleasant and, and more better. Uh, another example, kind of one thing that we talk about a lot are reset routines. So mm-hmm. they happen, you know, um, in a game, if it's a high anxiety situation, high pressure situation, or you make a mistake or whatever it might be, a, a reset routine kind of gets you back down to an optimal arousal level. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, something like that can be applied, you know, to, um, you know, if someone's just really high energy at a particular moment, like we had an example where, you know, a youth was just really high energy before bed. So you give them a reset routine to do and, um, and yeah, then they're kind of ready to go to bed kind of thing. So it's just the strategies that we can give some athletes, I think, not only apply in, in athletics, but just in life in general. Yeah, exactly. And mm-hmm. it's so, I feel like, a lot of parents, maybe like when they introduce their kids to sport, there's always like obviously like that heavy hand and be like, yeah, no, you can, you should try it out, you know, it'll be good for you. But then also not knowing how to actually deal with the, mm-hmm. uh, you know, the athlete when, let's say if they're trying to take it even more professionally as well. It's also knowing that how the parent behaves to a coach also impacts how the, the athlete behaves to the coach too as well. And um, obviously knowing that, let's say a parent needs to know what kind of support that they can give them. Because sometimes, you know, you have like, um, the sideline coach parents as well, just telling the athlete what to do all the time and that might conflict with the coach and then that would just confuse like the kid even more because they're like, I don't know who to listen to as much and obviously you're my parent, but then this is also my coach who specializes in this. So it's it's like kind of, you know, some parents or maybe some family support networks need to understand that everyone has certain different roles as well, right. different functions yeah. of support too. Yeah, yeah. I think it's important to recognize too as sports psychologists that 
um, to a certain to a certain degree, there's a capacity to what we can help athletes with. Like, of course, if there's extreme examples of, you know, maybe some, you know, psychotherapy that might be helpful if there's like an extreme depression or anxiety disorder, at least for myself personally, that I'm not, you know, like a fully licensed psychologist per se, that I, I, I can recognize that when maybe something is in my capacity to treat or capacity to help and, and when something isn't. Um, and kind of like how you said, the, the whole kind of network, I think, is 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 um is important because when you get down to it there's probably a lot of a lot of problems that athletes go through that they either keep hidden or or kind of are, are layered underneath maybe some more surface level problems and just having that tight network of like kind of inter collaboration of different professionals and stuff just to help an athlete or, or a professional team or whatever it may be i think is just the best the, of course the best approach going forward yeah have you ever worked with like a let's say like a multidisciplinary team of like let's say with like physios as well and uh, physiologists and uh, sport therapists and so on. Yeah, so um, so not in the context of sports psychology, but in the context of my current, you know, my other my other job as um, like a behavior therapist for for children with autism, because um, I'm part of a, a children's hospital. We work with um, in collaboration with like. Uh, developmental pediatricians, um, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, speech language pathologists. Um, that's kind of the main core center of, of the team, social workers as well. So they're really kind of all tackling it from, from different angles and certain issues. One in one professional would be well equipped to train with. And another issue comes up and you pull in an OT or a PT, whatever it may be. Um, that's kind of really my experience. And, and of course, I mean, just anecdotally, myself i can just say that you see a huge you know difference in progress when you have a whole team of people working with with one child or or whoever it may be compared to um when you just have one person kind of taking on the the brunt of of all the the things to tackle yeah and um so what have you seen like any layover between your work with autistic kids and then your work as well with maybe like student athletes at all yeah so um like the the inter collaboration piece of it, or interdisciplinary team piece of it. No, so just in terms of like your background with work working with kids with autism as well, have you seen that it can like let, how it like transfers to uh, working with like student athletes at all? Right, right, yeah, yeah. So I mean, like really with the applied behavior analysis, kind of the 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 main foundation of it is just you know recognizing that that there's observable behaviors to change, and and of course you know. It's it's tough to a certain extent because a lot of the things that maybe we talk about in sports psychology are, are kind of mental things that like we talk about, like the mental game, like what's inside. I mean, the title of the podcast is Inside the Mind. So what's inside the mind? And you can't necessarily see what's inside the mind. You can see like the behaviors that give you clues of what's inside the mind, but we don't have you know, any way of, of actually like keeping track of what's inside a person's brain. Like I, like you can say you're thinking one thing, but do I know for sure that's what you're actually thinking? I, I really can't to hundred percent certainty think that. So really what, you know, with my work with children with autism, it's, you really, really focus on observable behaviors and transition over to sports psychology. I try to keep that same mindset as well. So whether it's, you know, we offer programs such that, you know, we, we have the option for athletes to kind of rec record their performance in the game and then we can go back and watch it with them. So that's kind of one extension of like, you know, we would see at the beginning of, of a, a program or something that they're doing, you know, X, Y, and Z on, on the ice hockey rink that shows that they're nervous or shows that they're anxious or something. And then when you watch them again in three or six months, you see that those behaviors aren't there anymore or, or happen to a, a lesser degree. Same thing too is a lot of the things that we focus on in our programs is like um, just different behaviors that you do after or before a game, whether it's like visual, uh, mental imagery, um, whether it's like um, different kind of like uh, reset routines that you write down kind of what your thoughts and feelings are. So there, it, it's always kind of an extension of what's in the brain and, and kind of writing things down that gives you, you know, some data, so to say, of, of to see the change in progress of, of from, you know, month zero to month six. Yeah. Yeah, so it really yeah. helps like monitor everything. I yeah, think. exactly. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I think maybe I, I like how you touched on the point as well of, of the fact that you, I mean, athletes don't always know what's going on in their head, and obviously, like trying to look, you can't always look into someone's head. So it's like not everyone has like that conscious knowledge in a way. So imagine if you're not self-aware of what's going on, and no one's always monitoring the thoughts that's going into the head too. 
obviously observing it as well and because how you're thinking and like let's say in a in an in your brain what happens is how you think or how you interpret certain events can will sometimes can be seen in your behaviors anyway in your actions mm-hmm. and then sometimes going back as well could be like oh yeah so what what do you think was going on then and sometimes that may trigger their memory too because sometimes it's also hard to think about oh yeah at this point in my competition two months ago I was thinking this you know because I mean d- unless you have literally the most amazing memory in the world it's also going to be hard for you to recall how you're thinking and like what you're feeling in the time what at what contributed to your performance at that point too so yeah right. definitely observing things and what's going on is such yeah a- yeah so that's why we try and get athletes to make some sort of, of written written down um kind of note or or even you know at, at the very least with some of the younger athletes maybe just verbal conversations with the parents or, or whatever might be appropriate but do yeah. something in in the moment or at least shortly after the moment so that um there's you know there's like almost like a trail of evidence of of what your actual thoughts were so that you're not trying to recall on things that happened two or three months prior yeah yeah um, one thing that you know oh go ahead sorry i was gonna say have, have you experienced uh, any um athletes or any parents that haven't been like as accommodating to like addressing the mental side um surprisingly no not yet okay. i'm sure that i'm sure that maybe you have some stories to, some stories to touch on that maybe but myself not really i think i think really there's been I mean, one thing that i bring up a lot with my guests is is really just the the shift in our society and culture towards the just yeah. the mental part of you know not even sports but just life in general of course there's there's a yeah. whole lot of new initiatives that deal with mental health like I know here in Canada, we have the, the Bell Let's Talk Day, where if you hashtag Bell Let's Talk on any social media platform, like Bell donates, I think it's a cent for every hashtag, but they'll get up to like a billion tweets yeah. or a billion things, whatever. So it gets up to a million dollars. I think in the last five or 10 years, again, sorry that it was like, there's just a real shift at, at focusing on the mental part of, of, of life in general and just trying to take away that stigma that, you know, there are issues that people go through and that you know it's okay to ask for help or to ask for advice on how to get through them so personally myself i haven't really met anybody that's been opposed to any sort of strategy that we've proposed or anything like that yeah i mean that kind of shows like the change in times as well like right. like the saying as well like mental health awareness as well is increasing and everyone's actually to start and like a lot of athletes as well like coming out with like their stories of maybe it could be like depression anxiety or you know, feeling certain ways and how, let's say, if they had a sports psychologist working with them too, how mm-hmm. that helped them. So it's obviously like changing the stigma that's around there. Yeah, yeah. I did a, a podcast interview recently with a gentleman named John Couture. He is a, uh, he, he's a former mental skills consultant yeah. um, with the Cleveland Indians. That's a professional baseball team here in, in uh, well, they're in the States, but here in North America. Um, and he was he started there in 1999 and he was kind of talking about how uh, when he started, there was only maybe like three or four people specific, like that had some involvement in like the mental part of the game there. And now like there's just a whole team of people and there's many d- different affiliate franchises that 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 they have, like their prospects play with and everything, almost like youth teams and, and minor league teams. And they all each have their own kind of team of mental performance consultants and stuff like that. So even just when him and I were chatting, it was interesting to see from 1999 to 2019, so 20 years, just the growth in, in professional sports, at least, and kind of the capacity of, of sports psychologists and mental skills coordinators or whatever title you want to give them, uh, yeah. but just the growth in that position. Yeah, and it's always good to hear. Like, yeah. see, he's experienced uh, the shift between, obviously, when he started and then to now as well, how, it, you know, there's more demand for it as well, mm-hmm. so... Yeah, it's obviously really good to hear as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One thing that, that I wanted to touch on, sorry, that I was just really, really interested in kind yeah. of reading up about you a bit on, on LinkedIn was that you were, you mentioned a bit at the beginning, but just you're working with esports, yes. um, particularly FIFA, because, yeah. you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a huge football or soccer fan, depending where yeah. you want to come from, wherever you want to call it. Um, been a huge fan my whole life, and of course, kind of goes hand in hand, been a, a, a FIFA diehard player for... Uh, this was actually like my first year kind of taking it off a bit because of like the frustrations and all of that that come from playing the game. Yeah. So this is something that I could that I definitely have like an interest in kind of exploring more is is the the application of sports psychology to esports because 
I think we've all been there. If, if, you, if you play video games at some point that it, it can get really, really frustrating and, and you, you feel that downward spiral as well when you're playing. Yeah. And I mean, so my experience within FIFA has been, I've, I've enjoyed it anyway, um, mm-hmm. but it's all like quite eye opening as well. And like even going to like the events there as well with the competitive players and like obviously talking to them as well and like doing workshops and so on you realize what the demands are and one big demand is going to be like emotional control and um being able to give attributions that will help you as well so obviously you know fifa you play fifa or anyone else who's played fifa knows how really annoying it can be in terms Mm -hmm. of like goals goals just don't go in even though you're literally aiming it directly at the goal or goalkeeping errors that happen or your center backs bang into each other and then they leave a massive gap for your opponent to take advantage of and you know trying to trying to help the the athletes actually understand that obviously this does happen and you do have to accept as well with the approach of acceptance is that you can't control what the game does because you know if you focus on what you can't control then that's going to open a can of worms as well and that's just going to go into a cycle of you just thinking oh, oh i hate this game why am i bothering and etc cetera, etc cetera, and it's not helping in any way and then it's obviously focusing now on, like, what can you control in the situation? Like, obviously, if one bad moment happens, but you also have to realise, let's say, if that's within five minutes of the game, you have have, what, like, eight, five minutes of the game as well that you could have done more of, you know, that you could have controlled as well and made opportunities that will help as well. So there's always always something you can control and kind of helping them focus on that a little bit more. Also being, like, self-aware as well and how people respond. Because if you imagine, like, you you're just letting things happen to you, but once again, you're not taking control of what, how you respond and how you react as well. So also knowing like with reflections is what a big thing that I've got. Um, so AS Roma with Fnatic and also um, Manchester City with their FIFA teams. I basically got all of them to actually start the process of reflecting as well. And then with that, they're actually able to be more self-aware. So they don't need someone telling them why was this that happened? They can know in the moment, oh, this is what normally triggers me or this emotion um indicates that i'm thinking of this kind of thought process right and then from that they're actually able to be like okay let me try and alter my thoughts here or let me engage in a behavior that helps me a bit more than just letting things happen to me you know so it's that Mm -hmm. kind of um those strategies and that kind of um approach that seem to have helped quite a lot of the fifa players as well and yeah which i've been happy to see the changes as well and especially Mm -hmm. when i went to the uh they have the playoffs for it's called fewc so it's like 64 players of each of both consoles um, come and play, and it's for like these top the top spot of the FIFA E World Cup um, championships. So within that, I got to see how everyone started responding under intense stress because this is like a do or die kind of situation for some players, and seeing how my players responded to let's say some difficulty compared to other people was so eye opening. Like um. Someone kept was almost about to like smash his controller on the desk as well. Someone was coming out screaming like, "Oh, you know, I hate this game. This game sucks. Like it's all the game's fault." This is like within like the first ten in-game minutes of the game, so he still had a lot left, but he already lost his head so early in the game. And then seeing my players like, let's say if they're losing two-one, um, and they have like only a couple of minutes left, seeing how they're still composed and then able to control what they're doing and then score in the last minute, you know, or you know, kind of go through that adversity and still be able to stay composed and stick to their game plan kind of helped me see like the effect of it, which links as well to like the whole observational um, methods and strategies that you use as well to monitor how athletes are doing, actually seeing that they've applied this and how, how they are compared to other people as well was like a really good moment for me to kind of just see as well. Yeah, I mean, I can definitely, you know, <laughs> just thinking back to my own experience playing it, it, for some, I mean, I'm not trying to, you know, yeah. To, you know, talk bad about EA Sports here, but it seems like every EA Sports games I play, I get super frustrated. And I think it's just, I think it's just the competitive part of it. Like it's, it's an extension of athletics to a set. Like, I mean, esports is, I mean, probably one of the most popular sports in the world right now to begin with. Like when you think about like Fortnite and, and League of Legends, Overwatch, those kind of games. Like esports is just, it's just taken off recently. And I think specifically like the EA Sports games, FIFA, Madden. NHL, whatever it might be, it's like an extension of, of us as athletes, and we're kind of reliving those moments, or, or and to a certain extent, in, in the video game world. And 
myself and all my friends and everything, I can just, you know, like how you mentioned, you get a bad goal right at the beginning. Like, I'll give you a perfect example. Of course, you're probably familiar with the terms, but I'll nerd out a bit here for for those that aren't too familiar. But the weekend league in FIFA Ultimate Team, where it's like the you play 30 or 40 games during the cross span of the weekend, and it'll be like one or two games in, and if I lost both of them, like my whole weekend. I just like have such a negative attitude towards the game and I just, I get on a losing streak and I can't snap out of it. And so there's, there's definitely kind of some applications of sports psychology that, that I feel like would be beneficial there. What was kind of your, uh, your take on like applying the, the principles of sports psychology from like a physical sports standpoint to more of like a, a virtual sports standpoint was it a seamless like kind of transition between the two applying the principles or was there kind of some creative strategies you had to come up with in order to kind of bridge the gap there um it's some it's somewhat um transferable though um i feel like because i understand let's say within sports as well you have different sports within traditional sports the same thing goes with esports as well so none of the no two games are going to be the same completely so with esports, you can have like League, Fortnite, and um, FIFA as well, and they their demands are so different too. It's I think it comes down to a case of knowing what the needs are. So if I'm looking at Fortnite and looking at squads, then my goal would be looking at let's say collective efficacy or like group cohesion and how well people work as a team. And then you can also transfer that with like your understanding of how people work in football teams as well. But then sometimes you have to be creative because let's say there's some avenues in sports psych that's aren't completely addressed um within within the sports like lit- uh, literature towards esports so going back to fifa as well it's it's in traditional sports you can control a lot of the things that happen so normally whoever wins either they have like some luck even though it's not to a great degree um and also they can control what they do but then let's say within fifa sometimes you literally have a streak within one game of just being completely unlucky and trying to help them still maintain control and, you know, attribute the causes to something that's that they can change and that they can control, because that's one of the most important dimensions of, you know, attributing causes is focus on what you can control. Um, making it like FIFA and games or situations that take that kind of like sense of control away from you really makes it hard to kind of apply um, principles to it. So you have to still try to figure out how can we still move forward from this and, you know, what are the kind of like the best principles to apply? Do I still need to apply this or do I need to apply like reflections? Do I need to look at maybe behaviours that I need to change in? Do I need to look at like how, what kind of strategies they have um, in terms of like technical stuff? And um, yeah, sometimes you need to be quite creative, but I think more, most of the time so far, what's worked is it's been like a seamless transition as long as you know what the needs are and demands and then what kind of strategy best matches those. It's normally quite easy enough to, link it within esports specifics mm. yeah. was it a hard was it was it a was it a hard sell to kind of introduce sports like to to esports or or did they kind of kind of grasp the concept and see the value kind of in it from right away i feel like they found the value of it more than traditional sports from my experience mm. like all the players have i think the, the fact is that because they understand that there's so much like fine motor movement that's needed like let's say like Obviously, you're tapping one key or you're moving an analog stick by a bit, though, but they know how important the mental side of it is. Like, if you're nervous, then the degree of error is there's so much more of an impact on it because you're making such small movements. If you're nervous, that movement can completely change how your character is moving in the game. But in, let's say, with football, if you're a bit nervous, you can kind of have that that higher degree of error that you can do. You know, you have more freedom to kind of make a bit of a mistake because you can still make up for it in terms of like the big general like gross motor movements. And a lot of the athletes have been really keen on it in esports. So if you're like, yeah, we definitely need this. Like we need to focus on the mental as well. And they really understand the importance of that. And even like with organizations, they do understand the importance of it as well. They're like, yeah, we do need to follow it. And that's come from successes with other teams as well that's used it. So Australis as well and using it for their CSGO team when they had a sports psychologist come in and they'll know for like choking a lot. And I think their psychologist called Maya, oh, I forget her surname, but yeah, she was, she's definitely called Maya. Um, <laughs> and she applied, she applied sports psychology in there as well and helping them deal with stress. And then they end up like getting the streak of like winning their competitions as well and not being known as the chokers anymore. So that kind of story helped 
the whole esports scene kind of see oh there's value in the sports psychology business and we need to actually start addressing this as well and seeing more people like post it within like League of Legends and FIFA within Fortnite within Overwatch and so on and so forth so it's it's good and I think still more people are still kind of adjusting to it but there's still such big room for improvement in it and such big opportunity as well to apply it there it's just now a case of knowing who to go to and who's who really values it or who's just saying like yeah we want it but just for free you know so yeah 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 i mean kind of it's interesting when you think about it how you mentioned how you did some work with manchester city and you know there's a lot of sports organizations around the world like whether it be the premier league or you know here in in North America, like the NBA has, I know they have their own esports teams as well, where it's like when you look at the interaction between the like the team and the esports team, they treat them just like athletes, whether it's like a, a basketball player or an esport NBA 2K player, like they're they're considered athletes, right? So I feel like there's already a lot of buying in, in the sense that if you have a team with a lot of resources like Manchester City that yeah. has probably a quite extensive sports psychology team to help their on the pitch athletes yeah. if they're treating or they see their esports team just like as a regular athlete as well then it probably helps in that regards that they're willing to invest the same amount of resources and they recognize at least that there is a mental part to the to the performance exactly and they yeah. like with AS Roma as well they treat um, so the esports team as well that I worked for with AS Roma, they get to go out to the facilities there and they can use the facilities too and mm. like talk to the players as well and like kind of interact with them. And also with um with FIFA, like during the FIFA E World Cup, the person who won it as well got to see, meet all the people in the Premier League and you know, mm. all these coaches as well and like all these players too. And even um one person, so in I know New York City has a football team and then they have an esports team as well. So I worked yeah. with one of their players who won like the E Champions League, um, so basically like esports version of the Champions League um, competition. And then he mm-hmm. got to you know go to the finals as well, hold the cup there, and you know experience all of this. So there's there's this like match and marrying between like esports and the traditional sports if they're within like the same organization. And I think the whole money side of it as well makes them also see that there's really big value in it as well. Mm-hmm. So yeah, and then obviously addressing the psychology bit as well is good, and they see the importance of that too. Yeah, I mean, if if I knew that if if I was re- got really good at FIFA, I could meet you know all these soccer player, football players, <laughs> I would have been a, less invested a lot more time into it. Cause I think there was a post recently I saw where I mean my my boyhood club is Juventus, so I'm a huge Juventus supporter, and I saw that they had just actually just form their own esports team. Yeah. I think they had yeah. they they hired three guys to to do it, and kind of behind them that like went through the contracts and everything with them was Pavel Nedved, who for those who aren't familiar is just like a a world-class legendary soccer player and one of my favorite players growing up. And I'm like, damn, if I, if I only invested, you know, a thousand more hours into FIFA growing up, maybe I'd be (laughs) sitting there with Pavel Nedved. Um, So, I mean, yeah. Yeah. It's crazy. Like the scene's just like popping up. Obviously everyone's like kind of, it's been under the radar for a long time, but then as soon as it's blew up, it's people know about it. As well, and even like pre, pre, uh, pro evolution soccer, I think that's where the players are playing. And I don't know whether they have a FIFA one. Oh yeah, it would. Sorry, yeah, it would be PES because they uh, there's actually the, for, there's a huge kind of thing earlier in the year where Juve kind of signed their exclusive rights to PES. Oh, so okay. Juventus Juventus isn't actually in FIFA 20 this year. They're they're nicknamed like Piemonte Calcio, just like a general name for for the team. They don't have their jerseys or or anything like that. Yeah. Um, so it is a PAS team, your PES team. You're right, yeah. That makes sense, yeah. So, yeah, like I said, like so many opportunities coming up, and people are like, oh, I didn't actually think I'll be able to play video games and get paid this much for it, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah. But then, yeah, I think. Yeah, sorry, Karen. Oh, I was gonna say, you know, like, that, like just the growth of it. Like, I think the 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 one big Fortnite tournament they had the, the earlier in the year, the guy won like three million dollars from it, and that's yeah. like yeah. more than a lot of professional athletes in the world. And he yeah. just got that from one tournament. Exactly. And yeah. it's nuts. Like, even with, like, the FIFA um, tournament, I think the prize was, like, $250,000. Mm-hmm. And then I I looked at, um, let's see, the CrossFit Championships or CrossFit Games and saw, I think the winner got $300,000 as well. And the fact is that FIFA is not, like, the greatest, highest paying, like, competition. And then you start realizing that there's there's literally so much more money and prize money in esports as well then traditional sports and it's really taken over in that but then sometimes it gets to a point where you think 
you know, you do what you love and then now you're getting paid for it. And then now where's your motivation going? Because now people start getting motivated by money rather than paying it. And then they seem to be more reluctant on, let's say, grinding out the game a bit more or maybe kind of seeing the enjoyment value of it as well. So it kind of takes away the joy of playing. So then that's yeah. kind of like a barrier as well that comes in with like commercializing and, you know, monetizing this game that you love to play. And then now it's like more of a job that you're doing. You just have to kind of like go through the motions in some cases. Yeah, it's it's, it's a it's a very different environment, you know, when you're at home with three or four buddies playing yeah. FIFA or Madden, whatever it might be, to be on a world stage playing for two hundred fifty thousand dollars, like just the the pressure that you feel, and and again, that that is, I mean, it's an old saying that I don't know how applicable it is to, to these days, but it's kind of like, if you do what you love as a job, I mean it could it has a potential to kind of turn into something you don't like because when money is attached to it, you can get caught up in the money and everything. Um, but I mean, that's not something that I like to believe in too much. I like to think in, in, in the terms of, I think it was a Muhammad Ali quote where he said that if you, if, if you love what you do, you never work a day in your life. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's kind of what I like to live by. And maybe for some of those FIFA players, it is the case where, you know, they did actually love it. And then once the money got tied in, then it became something else. And it could also be the case that maybe from the get go, they thought they had loved it, but it was actually a, di a different reason. And they just maybe didn't have the awareness to see why they actually liked it in the first place. Yeah. And then when the money came along, that kind of just brought that up to light. So I think it, it's definitely a, a tricky road to, to go down. And I think it really just highlights just how much importance is kind of given to these high stake esports games and just how much, you know, how much mental pressure these, a these athletes are going through. Yeah. One other thing that I that was really interested, kind of taking a bit of a detour from esports, but one of the articles that you posted that I was really interested in talking about, because it's something that I had to go through um, in the summertime, was yeah. um, I think it said something about like how being injured is good for you. Oh something yeah. To that ex effect as an athlete. Yeah. And because I mean I've I've had a, a whole host of injuries throughout my life, but most recently. Currently, my my kind of sport of the moment is is tennis. So I'm trying to train up for some ten, tennis tournaments and whatnot. And in the summer, I had a pretty bad uh, ankle sprain, so I was out for about a month or two. And that was the worst month or two of my of my life in recent memory because all I wanted to do was play tennis, and all I could think about was playing tennis. And the only thing I couldn't do was play tennis. So it was a really negative experience for me. Maybe thinking back, I didn't have the right tools or right mindset when when looking back at the situation about how to deal with the injury. Yeah. Um, so what was kind of the main the main points, I guess, of the article that you're trying to get across? Because I think to most athletes, they see injury as, as a bad thing and that yeah. there's not really any good that ca can come from it. Yeah, it's more of a case of you start to realize that injury can also give you an opportunity. So actually understanding that because you're injured, you can actually start focusing on, let's say, if you're trying to build another skill, which could be visualizing at one point, or it could be getting used to self-talk, it could be used, getting used to journaling. Or another one is um, taking the time to realize that you're you're not like this perfect athlete as well. Like really changing how you kind of view yourself as an athlete. So realizing that you do need to work on certain techniques as well, or you do need to start, you know, appreciating your body more, knowing how to take care of it. Because sometimes if you look back at it, it's like, oh yeah, I got injured because of this, but then was my nutrition right? You know, was I eating the foods that I need to that will fuel my body and also protect my body? Or were you going to the gym as much as you needed to that would help you? Or maybe are you overtraining as well? So seeing that, so the experience that you have is, is actually a sign of something and now looking for that learning sign or learning value that's there. So yeah, based, the moral of that, um, that article is basically saying like that there's learning opportunities within even like the worst of times that you have within being injured and that all the, most of the time, like I've been in the lot because I played rugby, so I was, you know, spending my time running at people that are like 20 stone or like 150 kilos or whatever. So you can imagine that someone's going to get injured in that. So my experience yeah. of it as well is like, I realized, cool, if I'm injured, then what can I do instead? So I can start looking at strategy. So how do I need to start working or making the most out of my position in the game? Or do I know all the strategies that we all need to do as a team? Or is there certain like, let's say weak links that I need to like, strengthen or do i need to work on my certain technique as well and going through that process so understanding that maybe 
maybe this is my chance to actually focus on myself and improve myself in one aspect not oh woe is me like I really hate being injured I want to improve myself think yeah cool I'm out now what can I do and use this time effectively and then that will help you out and it helps with some student athletes too because sometimes they put their education on like on as like a, as an afterthought so then they start realizing all right I'm injured now so I can actually start focusing on the academic side of it and realize oh it's not as hard as I thought it was. I just wasn't committing as much time to it and then start devising a strategy that they can start balancing education and also within being an athlete too. So that's also, again, the learning experience you can get from from it. But the concept is basically like sport injury related growth as well. I think the article was written by Roy Davis and Wadey um, in 2018 that actually looked at the other side of it as well. And also you have some people that when they start journaling or when they start talking to like a dictaphone where they speak about their experiences, they can put the piece of the puzzle together and they can actually find the learning value of it as well. And also people who are more hardy and more resilient see it as a more like an opportunity for growth. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I I don't know too much about the the youth student athletes seen it in in the UK, but I know here in North America and you know, it's, (laughs) it's, it's really amazing when you think about what, how much the you know student athletes have to balance between education and athletics like the athletics in and of itself is a, is a full-time job yeah. especially when you kind of get into like the NCAA or or like college american football or college american basketball yeah. um like like it's it's ridiculous kind of when you read about some of the articles about some of the players like the the amount of education they have to fit in in such a short amount of time just day to day because their football practice or whether it be, you know, practice or film study or traveling for games or media coverage or whatever it might be. Like it just, it, it's basically like, I would say even close to like worth two full-time jobs, just being a yeah. football player in college. And you have to balance that with getting a degree. And so I think it's, there's something to, to kind of say there for athletes that are able, we call them in, in America. I'm not sure the term in the UK, but it's like um, all American academic honors or something like that, where, they they're exceptional athletes but as well as exceptional students they have like a 4.0 or 3.9 or 3.8 gpa something super super high and i think that it's yeah i think it's 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 really underrated just how much those athletes student athletes have to go through and how much they have to struggle in order to get where they have to go balancing their athletics and education exactly and it's obviously more important as well as they're younger too because they don't really understand too much of what might help them because they're still like exploring different things and avenues and you know what might work for them and what might not so that's also links again with having someone who's focuses on psychology being able to like teach them this is how to organize yourself or you know this is what you're experiencing right now in terms of like this is what nervousness is because some don't even know what nervous feel nerves feel like they feel like oh this is a funny feeling but i don't know what it is and then you realize that it's nerves and then you can actually start tailoring to that and teach them how to deal with it you know and yeah you know, helping them through that process as well can help them become better student athletes too yeah i think another thing that you touched on kind of that i think would be really helpful to other people kind of bit understand a little bit more is that like the mental imagery or visionary part of like being if you're injured you kind of just do those mental imagery exercises to help you kind of stay up to date or stay in shape so to say because yeah. um, i think there's some research that i had read recently where mental imagery exercises can be just as an effective practice tool as physical practice in and of itself and this is i mean the, the human brain is, is is a wonderful thing where just you know going through those mental exercises in your brain just it does something whether it's a neuron firing or rewiring things in your brain whatever it might be i'm not of course i have a bit of background in in, in neuroscience and, and whatever but not not yeah. very fluent in it but there's the brain is just when well, what I'm trying to make is the brain is an amazing thing and just mental exercises can make a big difference in an athlete's performance and it helps you know especially with an injury and it's called the basically the theory is called like the functional equivalence hypothesis as oh, well okay. so the fact is that when you people put someone in an MRI as well you see like the areas of the brain light up that are also that would also light up if you're physically doing a movement so if I'm just doing a squat and then if I'm going to imagine doing a squat as well obviously depending on how good people are like visualizing what's going on is it can activate the same areas of the brain as well and the same neurons that go through their body too so it's that's like how it can link and then it can also like solidify on um, learning something so i had one athlete who i think she's 200 to 400 meter runner as well and she constantly just visualizes stuff after training as well to help like get used to 
what she needed to do and what she needs to learn. And the next, you know, the next day she's like, she's drilling it out as well physically. So that can help her learning and skill performance too. Yeah. Yeah. Has, has there been, you know, since your kind of introduction to the sports psychology field, has it shaped or shifted at all how you view sports in general or how you view sports on the television? Like, does it change the way you watch sports? I guess I know for me personally, since I've kind of been in the field, the, in a lot of sports that I watch, I, I watch a lot of sports, but I kind of pick up tidbits that I might not have picked up beforehand about how certain players react in situations or maybe some of the leaders on the field or pitch, whatever it might be. They kind of stand out more to me now that I kind of have a bit of a different viewpoint of what they're actually trying to accomplish and the importance of those leaders as well. Yeah, I think definitely. Like um, I've I started like having kind of a great appreciation as well on looking at the organizational kind of view of it, too. Like. Because normally people just think about athletes and stress being like only there and then their opponent versus them. But then you also think about you know, like sponsorship deals and, you know, the organization stressing them too. like, um, let's say, with a, a national team and the national team stress stressing the athlete and maybe certain like politics behind it that can also stress them. Um, also, like within teams and realizing that, you know, that um, you can have leaders and you can also have, like, informal leaders as well. And, like, you have, like, some clowns in there or you can have – everyone has, like, different functions too. And actually looking at something, be like, oh, this relates to it. Or even with coaching and realising that coaches don't know everything. Because obviously before as an athlete you think, you know, coach knows it all, like, I'm a trusting coach. But then you start realising that, you know, obviously they're human and also that they have certain philosophies that they go by. And some coaches are more – open to you know getting people to be more flexible and creative and some aren't and then looking at what makes a transformational leader like how do they relate to the players as well so you you start being really aware of how people behave to each other too and the interactions are in there and you know you start realizing that there's so much more to it than what you just see and then you can start processing that a little bit more so you can pick up on a lot of things easier too even if you're just watching sport on tv but sometimes it means you have to try and turn it off because it might ruin the experience a bit, but, um, right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah, kind of, yeah, I, I definitely felt that ex- having to turn sports off cause it ruined the experience felt that a bit. And also kind of just being such a whole diehard fan of, of sports and whatnot that it, it, it's interesting kind of even some of the aspects of sports psychology as an athlete, I tried to apply to myself as a fan yeah. because there's times where I get so wound up watching the game where I have to do kind of like my own reset routine so that I kind of come back down to a, a baseline level of arousal per se. Yeah. Or else, you know, there's times where I would just absolutely just lose it because some guy made a play. Then as one of those things, kind of how we taught, talked about a bit with the esports, but things that are out of your control, like me as a fan, I have no control what the teams on the TV are doing. But yet I get so emotionally invested into it that it feels like I'm right there on the on the sideline. So I, again, the sports a lot of sports psychology techniques that I've learned and I have personally done as as an athlete, I try to apply again as a fan. And I think as a fan, it kind of makes watching sports a bit more enjoyable because I still have that emotional piece to it. Like I still love love things and hate things that go on and everything. But it doesn't get to a point where it ruins my day or ruins my week because there would be a point in time. It, um, I use Juventus for an example when you know last year when they got knocked out of the Champions League against Ajax it, yeah. it ruined my whole week and that's all I could think about for the whole week but I think now I have a, a bit more perspective on some different mental strategies and exercises I can do to help myself not get so caught up in that moment yeah exactly and yeah, yeah. like I said fan as well the psychology within fans as well as spectators too and obviously what you see can also impact your emotions so yeah that's that's definitely a good point to kind of like bring up yeah as well yeah yeah um anyways edgar i have to get going now actually but um i know you have a lot of good kind of social media content and, and articles and, and different infographics that you put up if yes. anyone wanted to check you out on social media what was the, what's the best way that they can they can reach you so they can go on instagram which is psych underscore check so spelled p-s-y-c-h underscore c-h-e-k or they can just go on my website as well um called basically psych-check.co.uk which has the links to the socials as well. And also the website has articles, infographics, um, podcasts as well with like Olympic athletes and international athletes too. And um, uh, videos too. And yeah, a range of different stuff. So that's where you can find all my psychology goodness over there. Awesome. Thanks guys again for checking out this episode. If you enjoyed any part of it, please share it with your friends and family and I'll speak to you next time.